Hey everyone, if you're familiar with TikTok and have shown any interest in the ongoing debate between Christianity and atheism, chances are you've come across Christy Burke. She's one of the leading figures in the deconstruction TikTok scene. She tends to get a lot of hate from Christians online, but I think she's one of the more insightful voices for her side. Recently, Christy took to YouTube to share her personal journey in a video titled Five Bible Passages That Caused Me to Lose Faith. Now, as someone who values open dialogue and the topic of faith and doubt, I thought it would be helpful to offer my own perspective on these passages. But before we jump in, I want to emphasize that this is not at all about dunking on Christy. It's about respectfully engaging with different viewpoints and offering my own Christian perspective. So let's explore the passages that led Christy down a path of questioning her faith. So the first passage I want to talk about is from Romans 9, which was the starting point of my deconstruction journey. Up until the point that I read and studied and chewed on the words in Romans 9, I believed in a God who created all people, gave them free will, and that he wanted all people to be saved, but he couldn't violate their free will to save them. And that it was the most loving thing he could do to give people freedom. And within that freedom, they could either choose him and go to heaven or they could reject him and go to hell. And that would be entirely their choice. I was an evangelist, so I believed in going out into my communities, spreading the word, trying to win as many souls as possible because I looked around and there were people going to hell and I didn't want that to happen. But when I was 17 years old, I was introduced to the concept of Calvinism. And when I was introduced to this, I said, no way. There's no way that God created people just to go to hell. And then I read Romans 9, starting in verse 16. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for his glory, even us whom he also called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. It says, it, it, starting in verse 16, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Meaning, there is nothing about you that can come to God and choose. God has to choose you. It says in verse 18, therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. When Christians talk about you have a hardened heart against God, the Bible says that God's the one that hardened it. And then it, it, it even goes on to ask, well, then why does God still blame us? You know, if, if he created this way, how come he blames us? And Paul is saying, who are you to question God? How can the clay question the potter and ask, why have you made me like this? It says, what if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? If he has decided he wants to create you just to destroy you, then he's going to do that. And that's his right. You don't get to question that. All right, let's break this down. First, there are a few red flags right from the get-go. As someone who has spent considerable time counseling those who have doubted their faith, I immediately noticed a key distinction that 17-year-old Christy failed to make. Now, this is no knock on her because this is a really widespread issue. What I'm referring to is the difference between recognizing high-stakes objections and low-stake objections. See, Objections to Christianity that carry high stakes strike at the very core of our faith. These include objections to the deity of Christ, the resurrection, or even challenges from mythicists questioning Jesus' historicity. If these objections work, well, Christianity is obviously false. But here's the thing, the debate over Calvinism doesn't fall into the same category. Calvinism would only be a make or break issue if you're trying to be a part of a particular Reformed Church. Now, I'm not a Calvinist myself, but I have friends who are. While I understand and even share some of Christie's concerns about God's character with her interpretation of Romans 9, I don't view Calvinism as an irrational position. In fact, even if you are a Calvinist and you're watching this, I think you could at least acknowledge that there are countless well-informed, 
good Christians who know the Bible backwards and forwards and yet hold different views than you on this matter. It's entirely possible to be a mature Orthodox Christian while embracing alternative positions to Calvinism. So Christie's objection to Romans 9 should be recognized as an objection to just one perspective within a broader scope of Christian thought. It should not be mistaken as an objection to Christianity itself. Now, I believe that there are many wise Calvinists who would respond to 17-year-old Christie by addressing her concerns from their own theological framework first. However, they'd also probably guide her towards resources that present alternative viewpoints and shed light on how many non-Calvinists interpret Romans 9. The Calvinist friends that I know would prefer someone to disagree with them on a non-essential theological matter rather than rejecting Christianity altogether. So what do I think the correct reading of Romans 9 is? Let's take a look at some of the most troubling verses from the chapter. So how about Romans 9.18? So he has mercy on whoever he wills, and he hardens whoever he wills. I believe God's focus here, again, is not on how God deals with individuals in general, but specifically on how God deals with unbelieving Jews. He draws parallels to the story of Pharaoh, whom God hardened so Israel would be saved and God's name would be proclaimed throughout the world. In a similar manner, God is currently hardening Jews who put their trust in their ethnicity and adherence to the Torah. This serves to highlight the amazing salvation through faith in the Messiah for both Jews and Gentiles. It's important to note that God extends his mercy to Gentiles even though they don't have the right genetics or keep the law. Yet at the same time, God hardens Jews who do. However, Paul clarifies in Romans 11.25 that this hardening of unbelieving Jews is only temporary and will continue until the full number of Gentiles has come in. Afterward, those unbelieving Jews will have the opportunity to be saved if they believe. With all this in mind, it is crucial to understand that the hardening Paul refers to in Romans 9.18 is specific to the Jews, not all unbelievers. It is a temporary measure aimed at maximizing salvation for all, rather than merely displaying God's justice through reprobation. Let's take a look at a couple more. Romans 9.22 What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Yikes, that sounds like God made a certain handful of people to specifically damn them. But Paul isn't aiming for a philosophical debate on God's dealings with everyone in general. No, he's taking direct aim again at the unbelieving Jews of his time. He uses imagery of vessels from Jeremiah 18.1-12, where God tells Jeremiah that he can reshape a nation based on their response. Paul's point is crystal clear. God has every right to alter the destiny of the Jews if they reject the gospel. Despite their privileged status as God's people, their disbelief in the Messiah leaves them molded for wrath. It might seem unfair from a human perspective given their ancestry and their adherence to the Torah, but guess what? God gets to decide how salvation works, and he's chosen salvation to work through faith in Jesus Christ. By rejecting the gospel, the Jews unwittingly serve a purpose in God's grand plan to show the world that he saves on his terms without showing partiality to ethnic heritage. This magnifies the sheer glory of God's salvation, encompassing Jews and Gentiles through his amazing grace. And don't forget the pots in Jeremiah's illustration haven't been fired yet, leaving room for reshaping. If those unbelieving Jews repent, the divine potter can transform them into vessels of mercy instead of destruction. Now, let's zoom in on Romans 11, 30-31, Paul drives his point home. Just as the Gentiles were once disobedient, but now enjoy mercy because of the Jews' disobedience, the present disobedience of those Jews opens the door for them to receive mercy too. So I don't think the best way to look at this passage is to argue that the vessels of wrath in Romans 9.22 represent an eternally reprobated bunch. No, these very Jews, disobedient today, have a destiny where mercy awaits them, and they can be grafted in again if they will repent. Okay, finally, what about Romans 9.20? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? I don't think God's flexing the potter's raw power over the clay, but appealing to the potter's wise craftsmanship. The potter skillfully molds the clay according to its nature, creating vessels of honor when the clay yields and embraces faith. But when the clay turns stubborn and resists the potter's will, it becomes a vessel of ordinary use, heading towards destruction. The Jews holding on to their national identity and good deeds believe that they were automatically entitled to be vessels of honor, but they missed the mark entirely. They pursued righteousness based on works instead of embracing faith, as Romans 9.32 says. So when Paul sarcastically asks, who are you, O man? He's challenging their flawed assumptions head on. He's saying that God's fashioning is far from arbitrary. It hinges on whether a person is willing to seek after God's righteousness that comes by faith, not by works. It's all about seeking, believing, and embracing the righteousness that flows from God's grace. 
So, in a nutshell, Paul shuts down the mistaken views of those who clung to their self-righteousness, revealing that God's fashioning is grounded in a willingness to pursue his righteousness through faith. What you can't do is just read Romans 9 without first asking yourself about what Paul is addressing here in the first place, and then following his arguments through chapter 11. Paul confronts the Romans' questions and doubts surrounding the Jewish rejection of Jesus, showing that it's not an actual setback, but a strategic part of God's ultimate plan. This is not a about individual election on my view. This is my take on these passages from a non-Calvinistic perspective. I'm bracing myself for the inevitable backlash from the diehard Calvinists in the comment section. Some will accuse me of twisting scripture and claim that I'm advocating a free-for-all interpretation, but that's not at all what I'm getting at. What I'm saying, really? is this. Christie's objection is actually not a make-or-break issue. It falls into the category of a low-stakes concern. There is alternative readings, different perspectives, held by reasonable people that I wish young Christie had considered before plunging headfirst into the deconstruction rabbit hole. All right, so we've just scratched the surface of Christie's objections as we've only tackled one passage so far. But don't worry, there'll be more to come. Stay tuned for the next video, and thank you so much for watching.